Welcome back to Computer Science 3200. This is lecture number five, and maybe the most important lecture of the term, depending on how you look at it. Um, to me, there's sort of this time, your life is split into two halves or two parts before you've implemented A star search and after you've implemented A star search. So A star really is this sort of canonical heuristic search algorithm that is Im that is implemented in almost every video game ever made, right? It is such a a robust and good pathfinding algorithm that it's been used for for many decades in a wide variety of sources. Uh, there's also a lot of variants of A star search which we'll not be getting into in this course necessarily because um, it's just a little, a little too advanced and we want to cover, cover other topics. But needless to say, A star is, is very, very important. And so this lecture is all about that. And then um, five days from now, so next Tuesday, uh, that is when assignment one is due and when I will be going over an equally important lecture, which is assignment two, in which you will be implementing the A star search algorithm. Not only are we going to go over um, the A star search algorithm, but in the next class, we'll be showing all of the search optimizations that I implemented into assignment one. And so that's going to be a really fun lecture, I think, um, to see all the different sort of optimizations that we can um, put into an assignment like this to make it run faster. All right, so let's hop right into the lecture. Oh, by the way, uh, I have this search visualization page. So if you go to my website, which is listed down below in the description, and you type slash search at the end of it, you'll get this interface here where um, you can sort of follow along with the lecture because I'm going to be using this tool um, as a teaching aid to do some examples from this um, from this set of slides. So we're going to be, you know, lecturing a little bit, learning something, and then coming back and looking at examples in this search tool. Alrighty. So let's get right in to today's lecture. So lecture number five, heuristic search and the A star search algorithm. So what is heuristic search? Well, we teased this a little bit in previous lectures. Heuristic search is also known as informed search. So an informed search strategy uses some problem specific knowledge beyond just the problem description itself. And we'll give an example of that in a second. So we're going to use some guesses and heuristics in this uh, context are just guesses to guide the search toward the direction of the goal. So we're going to come up with these heuristics or guesses in order to inform the search of maybe which node in the open list that it should explore next. And ideally, if we explore better candidate nodes, we're going to be able to finish the search in far less time than if we just use something like BFS or DFS. So this is going to hopefully reduce the total number of nodes searched and makes our make our searches faster. And in the, the end result here is to speed up the search times to the goal. So what do I mean by informed search? Well, breadth first search is an uninformed search because all it does is it starts down here at this node and it expands, it expands outward and outward and outward and outward. And it doesn't know anything about the search problem. It doesn't have any guesses of what, what might be the best next thing to go. It just goes out and out, expanding this radius as it goes. So that's best uh, breadth first search. Now we're going to introduce our first um, best first, or our first informed search, which is called best first search. So because this is also a BFS, we've called this BEFS, so best first search. So don't, try not to get confused between breadth first search and best first search. I know that they're, they're kind of similar when you say them. So best first search is an instance of the general tree search that we've already introduced in the course. However, when we go to select a node from the open list for expansion, we're going to select it based on an evaluation function, okay? And we're going to select the node with the minimum value of this f of n. So f of n is just what we are defining as the function that we want to minimize in order to take a node from the open list. And so best first is a little bit misleading 
uh, because if we knew the true best node, then we would go straight to the goal along the optimal path and there would be no search necessary, right? And so best first search is kind of like, you think of it as your best guess first, right? It's not actually the best thing, because again, if we knew the best thing, we would know the optimal path. So it's like best guessed first. So best first search can be implemented with general tree search by using a priority queue for the open list sorted on f of n. So what this means is, let's say, let me just try and draw something, draw something here. So if we've got our open list, okay, and inside our open list, if I can mangle this with my terrible mouse drawing, let's say we've got a bunch of different nodes in our open list down here. And inside here, we've got like f of n equal to 4, f of n equal to 5, f of n equal to 2, equal to uh, 4 again. Maybe we got 100 over here, and we have a 30 and a 7, okay? So in best first search, if these are the values of f of n, then we can implement this with an array if we want to. However, what we're going to have to do is search over the entire array, record the minimum, and then return the, um, the node with the minimum f value. This up here, a priority queue, is a data structure that will allow us to store this list in a manner that lets us retrieve the minimum value in less time than big O of n. Okay, so that's what a priority queue is. Hopefully you've seen a priority queue before. Um, oh geez, I kind of discard my um, stuff there, okay. So there are whole families of best first search algorithms and they each have different evaluation functions. Excuse me. But each of them has in common the fact that they have a heuristic function. And so this heuristic function is going to be called h of n. So f of n is the function that we're sorting on, right? That we're taking things out of the open list. And h of n is our heuristic function that is going to guess like which action do we want to take next. And f of n is going to rely somehow on h of n and possibly other functions as well. So what is this heuristic function? Well, the heuristic function h of n, n is a node. So we're going to apply some function to a node and return some value. That value is the estimated cost of the optimal path from node n to the goal node. Okay, so in, in best first search, we're going to have these heuristic functions and in general, 99% of the time, h of n is going to be an estimate of the cost of the optimal path from n to a goal node. Heuristic functions are the most common way that we give additional knowledge of a problem to the search algorithm. Okay, so remember, breadth first search and depth first search had no knowledge of the problem, but best first search, we are incorporating this heuristic function to give it some notion of, the, uh, of, of a guess at which where we should go first. For any heuristic function, h of n, we are also going to define that if n is the goal node, h of n is zero, right? So we can do that. We can test and we can say, well, if we're already at the goal node, then the estimated cost of an optimal path from a goal node to the goal node is zero. And if we ever had access to an omniscient agent, right? If we ever had access to God, if you will, like the God of this search problem, um, we would be able to have this perfect heuristic. So a perfect heuristic would always let us know the exact cost from a node to a goal. And we're just going to denote that H star of N. So in a previous lecture, we talked about the optimal cost. Here, we're going to talk about the optimal or the perfect heuristic function, which of course we will never have access to, but we will use that in some of our different definitions and proofs later. So I just want to introduce that, that term here now. So what is a heuristic function? So a heuristic function, let's say we've got a starting node up here and a goal node down here in the bottom right. Okay, so a heuristic function is going to be some guess at the distance of the optimal path between here and here. All right, so for example, this might be a heuristic function, the Euclidean distance. So if we take the Euclidean distance between this state and this state, then that is going to be a guess 
at the distance of the optimal path between those two nodes. However, we can see here, what can we see about this? What sort of thing can you tell about this heuristic function? Can anyone sort of make an observation about that in the chat, about what this heuristic function is? Like, how is this related? What mathematical property can we assign the Euclidean distance in comparison to the actual, um, the actual cost of the optimal path? No guesses out there yet? Okay, so I got five or six responses and then I got one person that said it is lower. Yes, so the Euclidean distance will always be less than or equal to the true optimal path cost. Why? Well, because you can see here that the Euclidean distance goes right through this obstacle, right? We can't move from blue to green. And this sort of as the crow flies type of um, distance, then um, it's going to be less than or equal to the true distance. Now, you can think of this as looking at a map, right? If I look at a map of like the Confederation building in St. John's and my location, and I draw a straight line between them, I'm never going to be able to actually travel that straight line. I've got to go roads and the roads have turns, there's buildings in the way and stuff. And so the Euclidean distance is always going to be an underestimation of, um, of the true distance to the goal, right? Because I've got to at least walk around this a little bit. Now, this distance, this is, could be another one. Maybe we're just going to go like, if we're here and here, we're going to move down until we get to the same row, and then we're going to move right until we get to the same column. Okay? So what can we say about this? Is this an underestimation? Is it an overestimation? Is it always correct? What could I say about this type of heuristic function? I feel like Dora the Explorer, like looking at the TV, like, can you find the overestimation? I know there's a little bit of delay in the chat here. Okay, so the answer to that question of whether or not this path will overestimate or underestimate is related. Someone said it's overestimating. Someone said is always lower or equal. It turns out it's completely dependent on which actions are legal. Okay, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. So let's look at this heuristic function again. In this case, it happened to be the exact optimal path if we're using four directional movement, right? If we were using eight directional movement, it's not the optimal path. It would be longer than the optimal path, right? But look at this case where we've got this sort of like maze-like structure. Well, that heuristic, which is called the Manhattan heuristic, by the way, um, I think I have slides on, on that heuristic later. Let me just double check again. Yes, okay, I do. So this, oops. In this case, we are underestimating the value, right? Because if we actually had to go through this path, it would be very, very long. And we've gone through all these obstacles with our, all, all these obstacles with our heuristic function. So that's just an example of a heuristic function and how it may actually guide us in the wrong direction sometime. All right. So greedy best first search. What is greedy best first search going to do? This is our first concrete best first search algorithm. It's greedy best first search. And it's greedy. It, it wants to go immediately in the direction where the heuristic tells us to go. So greedy best first search is going to expand the node on the open list that the heuristic thinks is closest to the goal node. And it will factor in no other information. And this is kind of smart, right? Because hopefully, that will lead us directly to the goal node. So what that means is for greedy best first search, G-B-E-F-S, greedy best first search, F of N, the thing that we're trying to minimize, is equal to H of N. That means that we're trying to find the node on the open list that has the lowest heuristic value, meaning the node that our heuristic is thinks is closest to the goal. We're going to select that node to expand excuse me, and we're going to go in that direction next. And this is going to somewhat 
resemble DFS, but it's going to kind of DFS toward the goal. And if there's an obstacle in the way, then it's going to have to back up. So we'll see an example of this now. So this is an example of what breadth first search would do. All right, so here we've got a start over on the left hand side and we've got a goal over on the right hand side. So if we have breadth first search, and now I'm gonna do these examples in eight directional movement instead of four directional movement. So breadth first search is just going to expand and expand those neighbors and expand that depth and expand this depth until it gets to the goal node. Oh wow, look at the, all the red on my face, that's hilarious. So that's what breadth first search does. It doesn't know anything about any estimates, it just goes, it expands, 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 expands until it gets to the goal node. However, best first search or greedy best first search, what's going to happen is it's going to expand the first node and then it's going to expand based on some heuristic function, which node it thinks is closest to the goal. Okay, so in this case, if we're using that uh, like Manhattan distance heuristic where we go up and then over, right? Then which of these nodes is going to be closest to the goal? Well, it's going to look like this one is closest to the goal. So that's the one that we're going to expand next. So it keeps going like that. It's going to expand this one next because it thinks it's closest to the goal. And then it's going to expand this one next. And it's going to keep doing that until it gets to the goal. Now you might say, well, why are these, why, why did it expand this one, right? Well, we're, we're about to show an example of that. Here's an example where best first search can kind of lead us astray, all right? So here's the same example, except up on the top here, we're gonna have we're gonna block this off as well, so it can't easily go up on top. So here's that example. We're gonna expand this node because it thinks it's closest, then this one, then this one, and then what's going to happen? I don't know why I didn't I didn't do more of these. All right, so it's gonna expand this one next. Then from here, it's gonna think this one is the best, but then we can no longer go this way. So then it thinks this one is the best then this one, then this one, then this one, then this one, right? And so it kind of leads us away from the goal for a little bit. And so the heuristic, even though it's like, it's yes, if we look on the map, sort of the map Euclidean distance, it's the, it's the least distance, it doesn't know that there's an obstacle there, okay? So it may lead us toward an obstacle that we have to, um, to, to eventually avoid. So let me just go back, and I said we would have this thing here. So let's go to, if we can open up that search thing, uh, we can actually follow along with this. So let's look at, um, down here, we wanna turn this on to single step, okay? So to change this to single step, and then I'm going to change this to greedy best first search. I'm going to left click right here for the start and then I'm going to left click right here to set a goal. All right, so that's how we use this. And now I can step through which nodes are being expanded in what order. And so we're using the eight directional Manhattan distance here, okay? So that's, that's, that's saying that the next node that we expand is going to be the, the state in yellow or the node that's in yellow that the heuristic thinks is closest to the goal right? And so from the starting node, it thought that this one was closest to the goal. So we expand that. Then we take another step and yep, it's that one we think is next. Then it's this one we think is next. Then you can see that, okay, well, it, it can't go here, here, or here. So it's got to start backtracking, right? So here is next, here is next, here is next, here is next. And you can see that it has to fill up this entire concave area before it actually starts going around the corner. Now, so that's a bad part of greedy best first search is that concaves are the bane of heuristic search, okay? Concave areas pretty much always have to be filled up before you proceed onward. That's just, you can't get away from that. However, the really good part about greedy best first search is that once our node is within line of sight of the goal, it goes straight to the goal. See how that works? So let's just run that again and we'll do an animated search this time. And so that's what happens. So we'll slow it down a little bit. So it's expanding all of these nodes 
and then finally it goes straight to the goal. Now let's look at, uh, we're going to look at some cave example, all right? I'll toggle this off. So there's some really nice concave areas in here that we can sort of uh, take advantage of. So let's look at uh, this spot to this spot. And you can see how the, the greedy best for search has to fill up that whole concave area. In fact, it's almost like it's filling it with water and it has to wait for it to spill over, right? But as soon as it spills over to the point where it can actually see the goal, then it goes right to the goal. So let's speed this up a little bit and you'll see as soon as this spills over and it can see the goal, then it goes right to the goal because there's no more obstacles. So see how that works? So that's greedy best first search. However, what can you tell me about greedy best first search in terms of optimality? Look at the path that it just produced. What is greedy best first search? Is it optimal? It's not optimal, right? Yeah, because that path is pretty terrible. Someone said it's optimal. I would look again because I think we could get to the goal faster by immediately moving to the left instead of going up and to the right, okay? Um, so that is definitely not optimal. And let's look at one more example where we sort of go through the whole map here. Now that's pretty good so far at the beginning, right? It was going right toward the goal, but then it started hit to hit the uh, to hit the the bad parts. Oh, look! Now it thinks this way is the goal. It has to fill all that up, and now it has to come in here, and it's still like it's still filling stuff up, and then it gets to the goal. So you can see all of these zigzags. Like this is not optimal. It should have gone straight down. Um, this is optimal. Okay. Now without without introducing a star yet, let me show you what a star does on this map. Okay. So. Here's what a star will do on this map is it will search more nodes. All right. It will kind of be going toward the goal because we're going to be making use of a heuristic function. So it's not searching like stuff up here, for example. Okay. I got to make this a little bit faster. So it has to search more nodes than greedy best for a search. But if it eventually runs for us, this is like the worst case scenario for A star, by the way. The path that A star ends up producing is optimal. Let me show this one again, because that was kind of the, the better example. So the path that A star produces here was optimal. So we're, we're, we haven't introduced A star yet, so I don't want to get too ahead of myself. So that's what best first greedy best first search does, is it tries to go straight to the goal. Um, but the problem is the guess of where to go can sometimes be wrong. So let's look at the uh, performance of greedy best first search. It's going to suffer similarly to depth first search. Greedy best first search in general is incomplete. Okay. And the reason it's incomplete is because it might not find a goal and it may get lost in super long paths if the heuristic is bad. Okay. It's not optimal. Well, certainly if it's incomplete, it's not optimal. And it, if it does find a path, it's probably going to find a path that's not the optimal path. And the time complexity suffers uh, in the same way that depth first search does, where uh, it's b to the power of m, where m is the max depth of a solution. Excuse me. All right. Let's put some properties on our heuristic function now. So let's introduce the concept of an admissible heuristic. An admissible heuristic never overestimates the distance to a goal. Okay, so if we have an admissible heuristic and we know that it will always be less than or equal to the optimal path, then that is an admissible heuristic. And you can sort of see an admissible heuristic as like an optimistic guess, right? So the admissible heuristic is sort of like, here's what the distance would be if there were no obstacles, right? And so for an admissible heuristic, H of N, h of n is always less than or equal to h star of n. Because remember, h star of n is the actual optimal cost from n to the goal. So if it's always less than it, then that means h star of n, which is the actual distance to the goal, or the perfect guess, an admissible heuristic is always less than that. So look at this. We talked about g of n last time. g of n is the cost of the path 
so far to this node, right? So if we take G of N and we add an admissible heuristic to it, then F of N equals G of N plus H of N, that will never overestimate the true cost of any path going through N when H of N is admissible, right? So we'll, we'll come, back, come back to this in a second. But first, let's look through at, at some examples of a heuristic function. So here's an example of the Euclidean distance, right? We looked at the Euclidean distance before, and I kind of answered this before, but tell me whether or not in the chat is the Euclidean distance an admissible heuristic. Is the Euclidean distance an admissible heuristic? Someone said no. Any other guesses out there? Got a few yeses. Okay, we have some people say no, some people say yes. Okay, well, the correct answer is that yes, it is an admissible heuristic. It always underestimates the distance to a goal, right? Why? Well, because it literally draws a straight line between the start and the goal. We can never have a path in two-dimensional space that goes a shorter distance than the straight line. And so, by definition, the admissible heuristic, no matter what type of path you take, is admissible. So we had about a 50-50 split in the chat. That's fine because it's going to take a few slides. It's going to take some thinking before you get the, the admissibility property correct in your head. Like, so what we're saying here, if we want to say whether or not something is admissible, let me turn off the notifications on my phone. All right. So admissible says, okay, look at the path that the heuristic thought of. Now draw any possible path to that goal from the start. If the heuristic has to be a shorter distance than any possible path that you can draw, then yes, it's an admissible heuristic. And obviously, I hope obviously to you by now, a straight line is the shortest possible path between two places. So a Euclidean distance is an admissible heuristic. What about the Manhattan distance? So this is called the Manhattan distance because Manhattan in New York is separated into grids. And so if you want to get anywhere in Manhattan, you have to go up and then over, right? So this is the Manhattan distance. Is the Manhattan distance an admissible heuristic? Well, it turns out that if you are doing four directional movement, then the admissibility, then, then Manhattan distance is admissible. Someone in the chat said for eight directions, yes. That's actually the only incorrect answer. I'm, so, I'm sorry to have to point you out like that. But if we had an eight directional movement path, then we could just come down here like this and go over. And so the four directional Manhattan distance is, is longer than the eight directional path, okay? So because there exists a path that's longer than it, then that would mean it's not an admissible heuristic. So a great exam question would be, is the four directional Manhattan distance an admissible heuristic for eight directional movement, right? And the answer would be what I just said. What about a diagonal Manhattan distance? Okay, is this admissible? Well, if you are allowing four directional movement, then your path would look like this, right? So for four directional movement, the diagonal Manhattan distance obviously is always going to be equal to or less than it. And for eight directional Manhattan distance, then yes, it is also an admissible heuristic, okay? So eight directional Manhattan distance is admissible no matter you're using four or eight directional movement. And four directional um, Manhattan is only admissible if you're using four directional movement. So again, you have to ask yourself, could a path possibly exist that is shorter than my guess? And if the answer is no, then your guess is admissible. That's the property of admissibility. Okay. So the A star algorithm, oops, let me, uh, 
let me have this pop up. So I'm going to animate this. The A star search algorithm. Here we go. It's the most well-known best first search algorithm. It's going to evaluate nodes by using G of N and H of N. And I kind of feel like I haven't explained G of N well enough up until this point. So let me really quickly do that. Um, I forgot to prepare my blackboard. Let me get my blackboard up and running. Here we go. All right. So welcome, welcome to the uh, to the blackboard room. So let me show you what G of N is because I don't feel like I've completely explained that so far. So here we are going to have a grid. Let me quickly make a grid. All right. So up here we've got our um, let's say our node is currently at this state up here. All right. The G cost represents the total cost of the path so far to this node in our search tree. So if my root node is right here, if this is the root node, then the G cost, oh my dear Lord, the G cost, let me increase the font size, is going to be equal to zero because I haven't moved anywhere yet. Okay, if I haven't moved anywhere yet, then my G cost is going to be zero. So, so far in this course, we've been saying uh, four directional moves have a cost of 100. We're just, we're just giving it a cost of 100. So if I come down here, if I go to the right and then I come down and then I go over like this, then along this path, this node is going to have G cost equal to 100. And the way we figure that out is that the action cost was 100 and we add that to the G cost of the parent. Okay, so down here, we would take 100 plus the cost of the parent or the G cost of the parent, that's 100. So here we have 200 and this one would be 200 plus another 100 equals 300, okay? So inside our node class, we store this G cost and the G cost is simply the G cost of the parent plus the action cost to get there. So that's what uh, the G value is. Okie doke. Let's go back to the slides. So what the A star search algorithm is going to do is the heuristic function is F of N equals G of N plus H of N. So it's the cost that we've come so far plus the estimate that we have to the goal. And so F of N if it's the cost so far plus an estimate to the goal, then f of n is the estimate of the cheapest solution of any path to the goal via n, okay? So that means I've come this far, f of n represents what I think the total path cost is from here to the goal. So what a star search does is selects the node from the open list with a minimum f of n. And the properties, uh, the like the performance of the A star search algorithm depends on the heuristic function. So A star with tree search. Remember we had tree search and graph search? So tree search is when we do not have a closed list. We just have the open list. And graph search was when we have a closed list. So this is the A star search algorithm in its form where it does not use a closed list. So it can, it can search repeated states. So here's the function a star. It's going to take in a problem instance and it's going to take in a heuristic value. So our open list is going to be a priority queue. And you could implement this as a, as a list if you want or as an array, that's fine. However you implement the open list. But the simplest thing is to just use a priority queue so that when we pop off the priority queue and we've sorted it based on f of n equals g of n plus h of n, then we'll always be popping off the thing with the minimum value. Then we're going to add the initial state of the problem. Oops, hang on. We're going to add the node containing the initial state of the problem to the open list. So that's how we set up a star search. We've got a priority queue and that priority queue is going to be the priority is f of n. And then we add the open node. So this is or the, the, the node with the initial state. 
then forever, we basically have the, the same thing that we had before. And so I just got to make, I had one typo here, so I'm fixing that before I show you. So while true, if our open list is ever empty, then we failed. So it's just like tree search, right? If the open list is ever empty, we fail. Otherwise, the node that we get from the open list is the minimum F value node from the open list. So if we've implemented our open list as a vector or an array, we would just iterate through all of them and return and remove the, the F value that had the, the node that had the minimum F value. Or if we have a priority queue, we can just pop it off the priority queue. If, that's, if the node's state is the goal, then we found the solution. Otherwise, we can just expand that. We, we just expand that node and add it to the open list. And this is almost exactly breadth first search. Okay. It's the only difference is between this and breadth first search or this and uniform cost search is how, which node we pop off the open list. So it's, it's really cool actually how these search algorithms all tie together. All we're doing is we're adding nodes to an open list. And then each algorithm just has a different method of selecting the node from the open list that we want to expand next. See how that works? So if I ask you, what's the difference between A star and breadth first search? Well, you can just say the only difference is breadth first search takes the first node from the open list. A star takes the node from the open list with the minimum F value. And that's it. That's literally the only difference between the two algorithms. And so that's why I taught breadth first search and depth first search in this course is to show you how related all these algorithms are. Okay. So what is A star's performance? A star using tree search is complete. It will eventually search the entire tree. It will just search. So it will search the entire tree. However, it will search the parts of the tree where the heuristic is lower first, right? So it's complete. A star using tree search is optimal if the heuristic is admissible. Okay. So using a heuristic that is not admissible can, and usually does produce, produce non-optimal paths. So this is very important. It's a very good exam question. Okay. A star using tree search is optimal if the heuristic is admissible. All right. Now, what about graph search, right? Graph search is what we actually want. We want to have this closed list. I'm not sure. Did anyone on assignment one try and run their algorithm without a closed list? Did your algorithm just blow up and infinitely loop and crash Firefox or crash Chrome? Um, we want to have graph search if possible. However, A star using graph search can return suboptimal solutions when we use an admissible heuristic. Turns out to be actually a little bit rare in practice, but it can. A star graph search using an admissible heuristic can discard an optimal path to a repeated state if it's not the first one that's generated towards the search. Okay. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to step through an actual example of A star running and you'll see exactly what I mean by that in the future. So we can fix that by imposing a consistent heuristic. So before we saw an admissible heuristic, and now we're going to have an even stronger constraint, which is called a consistent heuristic. What in the name of God is a consistent heuristic? Well, also called a monotone heuristic, a heuristic is consistent if this property holds. Okay. So what's H of N? H of N is the estimate path costs from n to a goal. So that has to be less than or equal to the cost of an action, which transitions n from n to n prime, which is the next state. And h of n prime is the estimate path cost from n prime to the goal state. So essentially, our guess at a current state has to be less than or equal to our guess at the child state or the child node plus the cost of getting to that node. Okay. So 
The estimate of reaching a goal from n is always less than the estimate of reaching the goal from n prime plus the cost of getting from n prime to n. Okay, now that is a bit to wrap your head around, but I'm just gonna leave it there and just know that for our cases in this course, the Manhattan distance heuristics for their particular cases, so a four directional Manhattan distance for four directional movement is consistent, okay? And why is that? Well, it's because for example, if we were here, and let's say our guess to the goal from here is 400, right? So our guess to the our guess to the goal is one two three four so that's four hundred. The next state is would be three hundred. So this is h of n. Oh my dear, this is n prime. So this is h of n prime below it, and the cost between them is a hundred. So you can see that h of n is always going to be. Is that supposed to be greater than or equal to? Is one second, let me go back. Yeah, I'm, I may have had that backwards. But, ah, oh, I just discarded my thing. Okay. Essentially, if you can show that your heuristic at one node, if you go to the next node and calculate its heuristic, if the difference between those heuristics is equal to the cost of traveling between those nodes, then you've got a consistent heuristic. Okay, so how would you have an admissible heuristic that's not consistent? Okay, well, maybe for example, you have the heuristic of just zero. So what if my heuristic is always zero? Well, if it's always zero, well, that's, that's admissible, but maybe not consistent, right? So just, just keep that in mind. All right, every consistent heuristic is also admissible. So consistency in your heuristic is a stronger condition than admissibility in your heuristic. In practice though, it's actually kind of hard to construct an admissible heuristic that isn't also consistent. So if h of n is consistent, the values of f of n along any path are non-decreasing. That's very important, okay? So it means that as we expand new nodes, f of n is never decreasing. So the sequence of nodes expanded by a star using graph search is in non-decreasing order of f of n. So if it's non-decreasing, that means the first node that we select to expand is always on the optimal path to its state. Since all the later nodes, if it's non-decreasing, all the later nodes that would have been expanded would have been at least as expensive as this path, okay? So A star using graph search is optimal if H of N is consistent. So this is A star tree search, okay? And it's optimal if H of N is admissible. And then we add in the closed list and we now have that it's only optimal if h of n is consistent. Now, here is another, uh, here are two optimizations that I wanna show you for A star. Now it turns out that these optimizations may not actually save you time in practice, but they will save you time theoretically, okay? So in computer science, we have these like algorithmic theoretical solutions and where we apply like big O of N and all this kind of stuff. However, just because we reduce the theoretical time complexity, when we go to actually implement that in real silicon, it may not run as fast, okay? So I'm gonna show you right now two theoretical optimizations that you can try for assignment two if you want and whether or not your code actually ends up running faster, you can test on your own. So here is a theoretical optimization. One, if any node n, so when we're expanding our children, okay, when we generate a new child, if a node n in the open list has a state equal to the child's state 
and the G cost of that node in the open list is less than the G cost of the child continue. What does that mean? Well, it means that if we generate a new child, right, then that's a new path to that child's state. But if we already have a node in the open list who has the same state and a lesser G cost, then that means we have already generated a better path to that node. And so any path via this child would not be on the optimal route. So we don't have to add that one to the open list. And when I go through the example, this will be much more obvious what I mean by that. Here's another, oh, that's weird. This uh, kind of popped out a little bit. Okay, here's another optimization is that when I generate a child, I can also check at that step if the state is in the closed list. And if the state of the child is already in the closed list, then I will never end up popping it off the list because it's already in the closed list, right? So if it's already in the closed list, don't add the child to the closed list. Now, this optimization will only ever save you memory. It won't save you time. Because if this state is already in the closed list, then we don't have to worry about popping it off anyway because we've already expanded it, which means that this version of the state is going to have a higher F value, so it will never be expanded anyway. So all we're, all we're doing here when we don't add this to the, well, when we don't add this to the open list is we are saving memory in the open list. However, checking to see if a state is in the closed list may take so much time, depending on your, your, your way of doing that, that this ends up losing you time in the end. So with any sort of search algorithm, there's always gonna be this balance between speed and time, or uh, sorry, between memory and time. And sometimes things that save memory cost time, and sometimes things that save time cost memory, okay? So just realize that. And there's not always a best solution. So A star graph searches performance, assuming that we're using a consistent heuristic. If we let C star be the optimal solution pass cost, then A star is going to expand every single node with an F of N less than C star. Okay, so for example, if we know that the optimal path is going to be 2000, then the A star search algorithm will expand every single node in the search tree that has an F of N less than 2000. It's going to expand no nodes that have an F of N greater than C star. So again, for our example of 2000, A star will never expand anything that has an F of N greater than 2000. So that means that A star is optimally efficient for a given H of N. So no other optimal algorithm is guaranteed to expand fewer nodes than A star. It's not very often that we get to call an algorithm optimally efficient. But so that's why A star is so highly looked upon, right? So why is it optimally efficient? Well, look at it, look at here. A star is going to expand every single node that has a cost less than C star. But if there was ever an algorithm that didn't expand every single node with a cost less than C star, then there might be an optimal path that we missed, right? So we have to, in order to ensure that we get, we get the optimal solution, we have to expand all of the nodes that are along the optimal solution or have an F of N less than the optimal solution. And because once we find a solution, we know it's the optimal solution, then we will never expand anything beyond that. So we waste zero time expanding things that are beyond the optimal solution. So that's really good. It's optimally efficient for a given heuristic. Now that doesn't mean that A star is the best possible algorithm for any heuristic, because maybe our heuristic is terrible, right? Um, but it is optimally efficient within the scope of using a particular heuristic. So here's some A star graph search notes, the pros. A star is complete. It will find a solution. A star is optimal. 
it will find the optimally the optimal solution. And A star is optimally efficient for a given H of N. But the cons are that the number of nodes searched can still be exponential in the length of the solution. So for many large problems, A star can be much better than uninformed search, but it's still infeasible in time and memory. Okay, so if you have a video game with like hundreds of thousands of nodes in your graph that you want to apply A star to, your A star search could end up taking up like gigabytes of memory or terabytes of memory, depending on the size of the problem. So even though A star is awesome, a lot of the times when you go to implement it in like a very large environment, you have to do things like like cutting off actions or limiting the, the radius of your search and stuff so that you can actually fit the search um, in memory, okay? Sorry, I had to cough there. All right, so let's look at an example. Now, I spent an ungodly amount of time on this example. <laughs> so before we get into this example, what I want to do is show you, go back and show you that um, search program that I wrote. So let's go back and let's look at this L-shaped wall example. Okie dokie. So if I do this again for greedy best first search, all right, uh, greedy best first search, and we're going to go uh, step and then rerun, okay? So greedy best first search goes through, oh, I can show the F, G, and H values as well. So let's rerun this. So for greedy best first search, F is equal to G, right? So I'm going to step, uh, sorry, F is equal to H, my apologies. So what we're going to do down here is uh, we're going to say, okay, find the node which has the minimum H value and expand that, right? So here it's this one. We expand, find the one with the minimum H. It's still this one. And we keep going on like that. So that was greedy best first search. Greedy best first search doesn't care how far we've come so far. It just says, keep trying to drill toward the goal. If we look at a star search, what it does is it says, pick the node that has the minimum F value. Okay. So it is going to search in a different manner because if I just, let me, let me just animate this. It's going to backtrack a little bit. Uh, actually, let me just, let me just do the example. I wrote the example for a reason and, and this doesn't fully uh, encapsulate it. Let's just do the example for A star. All right, here we go. This, this is going to be, it's going to take a little bit of time, but hopefully this example is going to show you um, like really drill it into your brain what, what the A star search algorithm is doing. Okay, so this is an example of A star using the closed list with a consistent heuristic. And for this example, we are using the diagonal Manhattan distance as a heuristic. So the action costs are 100 for a cardinal move, meaning up, down, left, or right, and 141 for a diagonal move. So why is it 141? It's because the square root of two is 1.41. So we take 100 and multiply it by 141. So we're just giving sort of distance values to our actions, okay? And I multiplied them by 100 so that I could stay within integers rather than like 1.41 whatever. So this is why I'm using integers. So just realize that a cardinal movement is 100 and a diagonal movement is 141. Down here in the bottom left corner, I have a, a shorthand version of the A star algorithm. So while we still have things left in the open list, we remove the minimum F from the open list. If that's the goal, we return the path. If it's not the goal, then if the state is in the closed list, continue. I'm not re-expanding this one. If it's not, if it is in, sorry, if it's not in the closed list, then I add it to the closed list because I'm about to expand it. Then I expand it 
and return the children. So each C here is a child of the node. So the nodes, uh, the child, child nodes of this node. And then if the state is in the close list, I continue. Remember, that's one of the optimizations that I did. And also if C is in the open list with a less than G continue. So I'll explain that again and you'll see. That's like, if we've already searched to a path to this node, or the, sorry, to this state with a lesser G value, don't add this to the open list. So if it's not, if the child is not in the closed list and we haven't already generated a better path to it, then I add it to the open list. Okay, so here we go. The very first thing I do is I set up the open list. And so here is my open list. Here's all the data from the open list. I've got some headers up here. The headers are the ID of the node. So this is just so we can keep track of nodes, okay? So the first node I generate is gonna be called node zero. The second one is node one. The third one is node two, et cetera, et cetera. This is the state of the node. So up here, we are at the start location. That's the initial state in yellow up here. This is the only node that's currently on the open list. So up here, you'll see yellow if a, if a, a node exists in the open list that represents this state and you will see a red state if that state is on the closed list. We've also got the G cost of the root node. And since it's the root node, it hasn't gone anywhere yet. So of course the distance traveled so far, which is represented by G is zero. The H value is our diagonal Manhattan distance, okay? So that is 141 plus 141 plus 141 plus 100. So hopefully that adds up to, to uh, 523. So just again, the heuristic from here to the goal node is the, is the diagonal Manhattan distance, which is this, okay? The F value is just the G value plus the H value, right? And here, the action that generated this node, well, the action that generated it, we didn't have an action because this is just a root node, so I've just set this to negative one, negative one, okay? Just something to differentiate it. And the parent node, which is P, is null, all right? And the, the closed list starts with no states on it. So this is the very start of A star, and this is the state of the open list when we've just put in the initial state onto the open list. So what do we do first? Well, we're going to remove the minimum F value node from the open list. So since this is in purple here, I've colored it in purple here, all right? So I've tried to color code this so when you're stepping through, you can see the, like the part of the algorithm that we're on. So we look through the open list and we find the, the node that has the minimum F value. Now, of course, there's only one node on the open list now. So the minimum F value is trivial. It's just the first node, okay? So now we check the next line of code. If the state of the node is the goal, return path. Well, is the state equal to the goal? No, it's not. So we don't. If the state of the node is in the close list, continue. So we look at the close list. The state is not in the close list, so we keep going, okay? Uh, continue in this case means restart the loop. So we keep going in the loop. Now we're going to add the state to the closed list. So we add the state to the closed list, okay? So state zero or node zero, the state of node zero was zero, zero. So the state is added to the closed list. Now we're going to expand that node represented by N zero. So what we do is we're going to start generating children. So we're just going to go around clockwise and generate children. So here is the first child, okay? This child is going to have a G cost of 100 because to get there from the first node, we go to the right. And of course, up, down, left, and right have a cost of 100. So it's the parent state's G cost plus 100 to get the child state's G cost. So we look at this child and we say, is the state of that child in the closed list? No, it's not, so we keep going. Is there a node in the open list with the same state as this child with a lesser G value? No, the open list is currently blank, so we keep going. So what we do is we add this child to the open list, okay? So this child has an ID of one, it's at state one, zero, it has a G cost of 100, it has an H cost equal to this Manhattan distance. So that's 141 plus 141 plus 100 plus 100. So that's what this H is. 
And so its F cost is equal to its G cost plus its H cost, so that's 582. The action that generated this node was moving one to the right and nothing in the, in the Y, and the parent node of this is equal to zero. So zero meaning node zero, okay? All right, so let's go on to the next child. So here's the next child that it expands. Here's the child. It has a G cost of 141 because it used a diagonal move to get from the parent node to here. So we apply all of the same logic from uh, that we did for the previous node, which is now in the open list, to this one. We generate it. We say, is the state in the closed list? No, it's not. Is there a node in the open list with the same state that has a lesser G cost? No, there isn't. So we add it to the open list. And then we do the same thing for this node, except it's down instead of to the right. Okay, so after one expansion of one node, here's what we're left with. We've got one state in the closed list, and we've got three nodes in the open list. Okay, so now what we do is we're back up to the top here, and we say, while open list is not empty, keep going. So the open list is not empty. So what do we do? We grab the node from the open list that has the minimum F cost. All right, so we're gonna look here. Uh, the F cost of node one is 582. The F cost of node two is 523. And the F cost of node three is 523. Okay, so there's a tie for the minimum. So we're just gonna take the first one. All right, so that's what we do. We look at node two and we're gonna remove that from the open list. Alrighty, now we come down here and we say, is it the goal? No, it's not. Is it in the closed list? No, it's not. So we add it to the closed list, okay? So this state is now added to the closed list and we are about to expand its children. But you can see now, uh, not quite now, but you will later, how whenever we pop something off of the closed list, sorry, when we, when we add something to the closed list, we are now sure that we have generated the optimal path to that goal. And that'll become a little more apparent in the next example. Okay, so now what we do is we generate the children of this node, okay? So we're gonna start up here and we're gonna go clockwise, clockwise all around. So just to show that again, I'm gonna start here and I'm gonna go clockwise like that. So the first child of this node is this one, right? Because up left is a legal action. So we come down here, we generate this child, and we say, is the state of this child in the closed list? Oh, look, it is. So if the state of that node is in the closed list, we don't want to research to that node because we know that we've already generated the optimal path to that node. Okay, so we're going to just continue, discard, go on to the next uh, node. So here we generate the next child. So we say, is the state of that child in the closed list? No, it's not. There's no one zero over here. However, we go and we say, is there a, a node in the open list with the same state as this child with a lesser G value? Okay. So let's look at the open list. Well, this, this state is one zero. So we look over here and we have one zero, right? So what's the G cost of this child? It's 241. But the G cost of the, the same, well, of the node with the same state in the open list is 100. So that means we have already generated a path to that state, which only costs 100. So why would we continue the search from a node to that state that has a higher G cost? Because this path is just a worse path, right? It's way worse to go down right and then up than it is to just go right. And so a little bit of an optimization here is that since there's already a node in the open list that has the same state but a lower G cost, we do not need to add this node to the open list. Now, another a caveat to that is that we could add it to the open list. It would just never be expanded, okay? And so all we are doing with this green optimization is saving memory in the open list. 
And it turns out that the actual, once your open list starts to get really large, it actually takes a long time to go through the entire open list than it does to just add it to the open list, right? It's not going to affect our final solution. This is just a memory saving cost. And so if it's just a memory saving cost, but it's gonna take a lot of time, maybe it's not even worth it, okay? So what I recommend is try and implement this, run your, run your search with it, and run um, your search without it. Uh, someone said, when you added child nodes one, two, three, isn't node one's G cost less than or equal to node two's G cost? Yes, it is, but they're not the same state, okay? So I couldn't fit it in this line, but the nodes in the the nodes in here have to be the same state. So here I'm saying the node has to exist in the open list with the same state of one zero as this child's state before I implemented this this optimization. Okay? If they don't have the same state, they don't have anything in common. Someone said, if you have the open list as a dictionary, you can hash the states. Yes, so there are things that you can do, but if you just have it implemented as like a priority queue, then it can, it can be complicated. But let me go on. Let me go on with the example. All right. So the next node or the next child would be this one if we just keep going around counterclockwise, right? So let's look at this child. Um, this child, it's not in the closed list, right? There's no two zero over here. And there's nothing in the open list with the same state. And so we're going to add that one to the open list, okay? Uh, now, this child and this child are not legal. They're not legal because they're walls, right? So that's a wall that we cannot walk through. So that's, they're, they're, they, we just skip those. They're not legal. The next child is going to be this one. The G cost of that child is going to be 241 because we go 100 from the 141 that we already did. And this one is not in the closed list and it's not in the open list, so we can just add it to the open list. Similarly with this one, oh geez, excuse me. Um, similarly with this one, uh, this one is not in the closed list and it's not in the open list, so we can add it to the open list, okay? So uh, we keep going. Now we look at this one. This one is the same case as this one up here, right? So it's not in the closed list, that node hasn't been expanded yet, or a state with that, a node with that state hasn't been expanded yet, but let's look at the open list for this green optimization. So this state right here would be zero, 01. So we look through our open list, we find a state with zero, 01. We say, oh, look, we've already found a path to that state and it has a G cost of 100. So we don't need to add this one to the open list, right? We can just skip it. Now, the reason I'm doing this optimization here is because I have a finite amount of space for my open list on these slides. So I'm only looking at the theoretical optimization here and not the practical optimization where searching through the open list may actually take a little bit of time. So let's go. We've, we've just expanded all of the children. Now we're going to go to the next node from the open list. So we look through the open list and we find that this one right here, node three, has the lowest F value. So that's the one that we're going to expand next. Now you may think to yourself, um, why didn't we expand this one next? Because that one's actually, you know, a bit closer to the goal. Well, even though, um, let's see, where are the, so there's 523 and a 523. So these two are, um, are the same F value, but we just chose the first one, right? Now, it turns out as a human, we can kind of look ahead and see that this is the one we eventually want to go to, but all A star knows about is the F values, right? So it's going to pick the one with the minimum F value. So here we go. We add this one to the closed list. And now that we've popped a node, we've gotten the minimum F value node off of the open list. We can now, I'm drawing this pointer because I'm showing you that we know now for certain that this path from here to here is the optimal path to N3 from the start node. So let's generate the, uh, the children of this one. Uh, 
So we know that this one is in the closed list, right? This child is in the closed list. We can continue. This node is in the open list already with a better value, right? So we've already got it there in the open list and this one is worse. So we don't add that one to the open list. This child is in uh, the closed list. So we can skip that child. This child um, is in the open list, right? So this is uh, one, two. So we look over here at one, two, and we've got a G cost of 241. That is less than or equal to, because it's equal. So we skip that one based on our optimization. But now look at this one. We're looking at this child. So this child is a G cost of 200 because I came down and down, right? So look at this. <laughs> this node, uh, one, Sorry, sorry, zero, two. If I look at zero, two in the open list, I have a zero, two, but it has a higher G cost. Oh, wow, this is something I never thought of before, okay? So I, I had previously generated a path to this node by going from here in the top left, down right, and then down left, okay? But I've just found a better path to this node. So this is a very important example. And, and the importance of this example is that you do not find a solution as soon as you generate the child. You find a solution when you remove a node from the open list, okay? Because when we generated this child of this, the, the first time we generated a node with this state, it was on a bad path. But only now are we correcting that. So. The thing about this one is that node six, the one we previously generated here, will never be expanded. And the reason it will never be expanded is because it's the same state as the current one that I'm expanding, but it has a higher F value. Okay, so uh, some people out there are saying that they're a little bit lost, but that's why you can rewatch this. Okay, rewatch it, slow it down, look at the slides, go through the slides one by one. Okay, this is, it's a step through and I know I'm going a little bit quickly, but that's what the pre-recorded lecture is for. Okay, but this, I, I'm teaching you about this optimization here, maybe you shouldn't. And the thing here is that we now have a case where we have two nodes in the open list and one of them has a lower G cost. Okay, so it could be possible that a memory saving technique would be to just look through the open list and remove the one that has the higher G cost. Okay, because we know that's not the optimal path node. And so we're never going to expand it. So why not remove it from the open list? However, in practice, that could be very expensive on an implementation wise. So I'm going to remove it from my open list here on the slides because I have a very limited amount of space to work with, but just realize that that could still be on the open list and the solution would be fine, okay? So here's what we're left with at this point. Here is the state of the open list after what we've done so far. And now we just keep going. We keep going and going until we expand the goal node. And I'm now that you've sort of gotten the hang of what's happening here, I'm going to like pick up the pace a little bit um, because we've already been going for basically the class time. So we're going to pick it up a bit. So here's the next node with the lowest F cost, right? We look down through, this is the node with the lowest F cost. We're going to look at its children. So we add it to the close list. We look at its children going around in a circle. We're going to say, okay, this child is already in the open list. Here it is with a lower G cost. So we don't add that one. And all of its other children um, are either in the closed list or they're blocked. And so we don't need to manually look at all the other children. Okay. So really nothing happened for that expansion. Now we look at the next one in the open list with the lowest F cost. And that's this one. So what we do is we look at the children um, and we go through and we see, okay, we, sorry, we add this one to the closed list 
And now we generate the children while well, this child is in the closed list, this child is in the closed list, this one's in the closed list, this one isn't possible. So we only really need to look at this one. This is another case. Now we're generating a node to this state and we look over in the open list and we're going to see, oh look, there's already a node with state 2.0 with a higher G cost than this one. So we could leave this one there if we wanted to, but just for the slides, I'm going to remove that one. So here you see I'm adding a node with state 2.0 to the open list, right? Because it's a child coming from node 1. The new path has a cost of only 200 to this node, right? To this state. And so if in the open list there's a worse path to the same state, just get rid of it. Now, you don't need to get rid of it. It's only a memory saving technique. And please, 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 when you go to assignment two, do not implement this, this optimization. Again, I'm only showing it to you because it's easier for me to keep, to keep it in the slides like this. So we got rid of that other node in the open list that generated a worse path to it. So one more time to drive home what we just did is that we saw Initially, we had generated the path to this state by going down right, then up right, which is a bad path because just going right, right is better, right? So when we generated the right, right path, we saw that this state can be gotten to better than the other path. And so we removed the other version from the open list. That, that's all that happened there. Okie doke. So now we look at the next one with the minimum F cost. And look at this, A star is kind of dumb. A star thinks this one is the closest to the goal list. Even though it's completely surrounded by closed nodes and walls, its F value is still lower than the F value from right here, okay? So we're gonna look at this node, we're gonna take it, we're gonna add it to the closed list, but there's no children, right? So there's no children, so we don't go any further with that one. Now what do we do? Keep going with the algorithm. So we choose the minimum F value from the, from the open list. That's this one. And then we generate its children. So we've got one child here. It's not in the closed list. It's not in the open list. So we add it to the open list and we generate this child here, which is again, not in the closed list or the open list. So we generate that one. Okay. Now we pick the minimum node from the open list in terms of its F value. That's this one. We're gonna generate after we, sorry, we add that to the, to the closed list and then we generate its children. So we generate this child. Uh, this one's already in the open list, but it's got a, a better G value. It's this one, right? It's 300 instead of 440. So we just don't bother adding that one to the open list. Then we generate this child um, and we, it's not in the state, it's not in the closed list. So we add it to the open list. So this is the state of our search after this iteration. Then we just keep going. We take this one out of the open list uh, and then we generate its child and we add that one to the open list. Now we generate, we pull this one out of the open list because it's still, it has the minimum F value. We generate its children. Here's the first child. Now, this child is the goal location, okay? But we are currently down here in the expansion part of the algorithm. You do not find the solution at the time of child generation. You only check for solutions after you remove it from the open list. That is very important. And we saw that up here with that example when we first generated the node to this state, right? It was via going down right and then up right. And it wasn't until we actually added that node to the closed list or we expanded it that we, we saw the optimal path of that node. So that's just a note that even though right now we are generating a child that has the state of the, of the goal, that is not necessarily the child that we want to select. So we just add it to the, to the open list and move on quietly. So we add the other child of node 12 to the closed list or to the open list and move on. Now what we do is we take the node with the lowest F value, which is, oh, sorry, which is uh, 13. So we look at that one and now we say, okay, is this node, 
is the state of this node the goal? If it is, then we return the path. Okay, so the way we return the path is we look at the parent pointers of this node. So we go to this node's parent, then its node's parent, then sorry, then, then that node's parent, then parent, then parent, then parent. And so we can see if we reverse the parent pointers, the optimal path from the start to the goal is that way. And so once the goal has been expanded, you reconstruct the optimal path by visiting the parent pointers of the nodes. Okay, so I know that was a long example, but I want you to have that there so you can step through and make sure that intuitively what's going on in your head, it's very important that you realize that because this is a very good exam question. It's like any part of what A-star is doing is a good exam question. Alrighty. Now that you have that, I'm gonna talk just a little bit about weighted A-star and how how we can tweak A star to get different performance out of it. And, and I'll show you, this is actually gonna be really cool. This is going to tie a few algorithms together in a way that you probably haven't thought of before, even if you've seen A star and these other algorithms before. So we can tweak the performance of A star by adding a weight parameter, W. And what we're gonna do with that parameter is we are going to multiply our heuristic by W, okay? So our G of N is gonna stay the same, but our weight heuristic, uh, we can change that. Sorry, we're going to weight our heuristic by W and we can change the value of W. All right, so look at this. As we increase the weight, so let's say we start out with a weight of one. If we have a W equal to one, then this is just the formula for A star right? It's just G of N plus H of N. But as we start increasing the weight more and more and more, we are valuing the heuristic more and more and more, right? And so if we think of having a W value of like a million or infinity, then all F of N cares about is H of N. And if we keep lowering our weight from one down towards zero, then a star cares less and less and less about the heuristic. So another great exam question is what happens as W approaches zero or W approaches infinity? Okay, so let's just go have a look at that real quick. Alrighty, so we're gonna open up our uh, search thing here. And I'm gonna toggle off the grid so it's a little bit easier on the eyes. So let's look at an A star search from up here to down here. Now that's an A star search. Let me uh, let me do a blank grid for a second. So A star search, let me go back to uniform cost search. Do you remember what uniform cost search was? Let me uh, go to the blackboard. Okay. Oh no, how do I delete this? Boom. I gotta, you're kind of looking behind the scenes here of the blackboard. Okay. So let me make this bigger. Remember uniform cost, oh Jesus, look at that color. Uniform cost search. Uniform cost search had a, had a cool thing where F of N equal G of N. Okay. A star, let me, uh, let me put a, a little colon here, I guess. A star has F of N equal G of N plus H of N. Greedy best first search had F of N equal H of N. Okay. So I can think of this as having plus zero and I can think of this as having zero, right? Okay, so look at the relationship between uniform cost search, A star, and greedy best first search. So weighted A star has F of N equal G of N plus W times H of N. So as W goes up and up and up, it gradually 
means that g of n doesn't really matter anymore. And so essentially, as our weight goes up, f of n becomes closer and closer to only caring about h of n. And look at that. That's greedy best for search. And as we weight lower and lower and lower, h of n starts to get closer and closer to zero. And so a weighted a star when we lower the weight starts to go toward uniform cost search. Okay, so now that we've mathematically shown that, let's show that programmatic or, or implementation wise. Okay, so if I have uniform cost search and I search from here to here, this is, we are selecting from our open list, which is the node that is closest to the goal. Okay, so the G of N, that's the lowest. So if I go back um, to breadth first search and I'd search breadth first search, oh, let me do animated. So breadth first search goes out in breadth, right? So it's the number of actions that it cares about. If I do uniform cost search, it's picking the node that's closest to the goal. So instead of having this big square, what I get is a circle, right? Because it's always going to pick the closest unexpanded node. So uniform cost search looks like a circle of expansion. Greedy best first search looks like a straight line of expansion because it goes straight to the goal. So let's go back to our default map where we could have something interesting and we'll look at, um, first I wanna look at uniform cost search because this is going to expand in a circle. See, it's expanding in a circle and we may have to speed that up. So when the circle's radius encompasses the goal, that's when uniform cost search finally has a path. See that? If we switch to greedy best first search, greedy best first search doesn't care about G anymore, and it just expands the node that wants to go closest to the goal. So let's look at A star search, which uses both G of N and H of N. So you can see it does expand kind of like a circle, but as soon as I start to get closer to the goal, the heuristic guides me right toward it. So, Let's look at weighted A star search. So weighted A star search, if I use one times the heuristic, then I'm just using A star search, right? So that's the exact same thing as A star. However, let's start increasing the heuristic. And as I increase the heuristic, you'll see that the search tends to favor more and more going straight for the goal, which is going more and more like greedy best for search. So if I have 1.1 times the heuristic, oh, actually, I want to write this down. So let's note the optimal path cost. So I'm going to write this in the chat. Optimal, so for um, weight, weight equals one. Optimal, what was this? The path cost, zero. The hell is that? Um, okay, so the path cost is 8643. 8643, and the closed list equals 867. All right, so for weight one, the optimal path cost was 8643, and we expanded 867 nodes. So let's go to 1.1 times the heuristic and see what we get. All right, look, we still have the optimal path, but we expanded 20 fewer nodes. Oh, that's pretty cool. By going more and more toward the goal greedily, we're going to ideally solve our problem in fewer steps, right? So let's keep going. Let's go to 1.5 times heuristic. Oh, look, we're searching fewer and fewer nodes because we're caring less and less about how far we've come. We're caring less and less about G and we're going more and more toward H. So here we still have the optimal path, but we've only searched like 70% of the nodes. Let's keep going. We double the heuristic. We're searching fewer and fewer nodes, but look at this. We no longer have, well, as soon as we went above the heuristic, we no longer have an admissible heuristic or a consistent heuristic. So we can't be guaranteed about optimality anymore. So 
Our path cost now is 8807. The optimal was 8643. So you can see here that the path kind of went in a little bit and then back out. And so by going straight for the goal, we're expanding fewer nodes, but we're probably getting further and further from optimality, right? So just watch. Here's A star with one heuristic, 1.1 heuristic, 1.5 heuristic, two times heuristic, four times heuristic, eight times heuristic. And if we went to infinite heuristic, we would get greedy best for search. So as we increase the weight in A star, in weighted A star, we approach greedy best for, best for search. And as we decrease the weight, as we saw before, we are approaching not caring about the heuristic and only caring about G, which would be uniform cost search. All right. So a great question on an exam might be, how would I turn weighted A star into uniform cost search? Or how would I turn weighted A star into greedy best for search? And now you should kind of understand what's going on there. Okie doke. And that is the lecture for today. So let's go back to the schedule. That was the A star search algorithm, hopefully in a way that has not been taught to you before, because I've taught this and implemented a lot of times. And I think that this is the best way of teaching A star. Um, if you go to Google A star, you're going to get a lot of different looking solutions. Some of them use the open list. Some of them use both open and closed list. Some of them have a bunch of op like optimizations in it. Some of them look a little bit different, but I like theoretically teaching it in this way. Now, please, when you go to do assignment two, implement it, oh, excuse me, implement it the way that you've seen in the slides, not the way that you've seen online. Okay. So please, I beg of you, and, and nobody who's watching this part of the last few minutes of this lecture is actually going to do this, but a lot of people get the assignment and they Google A star and they try and copy and paste. Okay. When all they had to do was look at the friggin' slides because it's there. Okay. Please, if I'm teaching you an algorithm this course, I will give you the algorithm that I want you to implement. Don't go implement some other algorithm that was taught in a different way, that's using different variables and all sorts of stuff because it's only going to confuse you. All right. So please stay off of Stack Overflow for A star and just watch this lecture until you understand it fully. Uh, on Tuesday, like I said, we'll be going over assignment two and assignment two might be the most work you've ever done for a single assignment in your entire life. But I promise you that if you end up doing well on assignment two, it will be one of the best feelings you've ever had in your university life because you're going to learn a lot of stuff in assignment two. Assignment one was basically, hey, get used to your JavaScript. Assignment two is let's go, right? This is AI, this is A star, this is search optimizations. And A two, A, assignment two is where the people who wanted an easy course just kind of leave. And it's where the people who want to learn stay and have one of the best courses they've ever, they've ever taken, okay? So please, I know that assignment two is gonna be a lot of work and people are taking four other courses and all that kind of thing. But I promise you that when you get assignment two working for the first time, it will be one of the best feelings ever. It's like nothing in life that's, that's going to make you feel good is gonna be easy. And that's gonna be assignment two in a nutshell. All right, so that's it for today. And I will see you next time for how we do assignment two.